Stockton. I am very, very um, fondly connected with this group. Uh, I think I got my first few um, speaking opportunities with the group and I've been really, really, I think it's the response has been really great and I've had been able to make very uh, good connections and networking within a software testing community, especially locally. Um, and it's been really great. So thank you again uh, for the opportunity, uh, VanQ organizers and Jessalyn and Optimus team. Great. So thank you everybody for coming and taking the time to uh, join us today. I'm hoping that I'm able to, I don't know, um, go a little bit old school and talk about where it all started, exploratory testing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the inspiration and, you know, why this topic and whatnot. So stay tuned. Uh, yeah, just going to keep. All right. Great. Uh, so just a little bit about um, the agenda today, we would start with um, just you know basic introduction, a little bit about myself, a little bit about where I work and what I do. Also about the inspiration of this whole topic and how it came into picture. A little bit about how it's formally defined. Uh, what what do we need to know about exploratory testing? What do we already know about it? What could be the unknowns and how to stay on track? Uh, and we'll sum it all up by the way of closing notes towards the end of this uh, presentation. Yeah, um, before I go any further, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to um, either write it in the comments or ask the questions as you have them. Uh, don't save up till the end if you don't have to, but we can always have time towards the end uh, to answer questions um, that you would have. Also, in terms of um, just your own experiences with exploratory testing, uh, we, we would have time towards the end as well to talk about it. So I would also really like to hear about your experiences and how it turned out for you if you tried it or if you tried this approach within your team. Uh, that is something we can uh, discuss as well towards the end. Oops. Sorry, there was a slide about me here. Uh, I'll probably add it back, probably didn't save it properly. Um, so my name is Neha and I am a director of quality assurance with a company called Samax Group. Um, Samax Group, and I had a good write up all there, but I should have tested it before, I, before I'm talking about it, but here it goes. Um, so Simax Group is an e-commerce company. It was form formulated in 2004. It's an e-commerce technology-based company. And what we are really looking to do is to provide uh, solutions for our customers. When I say customers, these are not just the end customers who are looking to buy a product or are customers of e-commerce, but we are also talking about uh, B2B customers. So we are talking about the vendors that will want to sell with us. We are talking about the carrier and the logistics network that are looking for solutions uh, in the e-com industry. And that's where we see ourselves um, as seemingly the leaders where we are way ahead of what other e-commerce based technology companies are doing. We do have a couple of brands that we operate under. Uh, we have uh, Samax Business and HomeSquare which is our uh, B2C websites uh, where we work with the vendors and we act as a third party to uh, basically like a dropship model. So we don't own the inventory. Uh, those are the websites that our customers can buy our products from. Uh, we also have some products uh, that are designed in a way to offer the solution to the e-commerce industry. We have a product called ChannelGate. Uh, ChannelGate is um, sort of a one-stop um multi-channel platform uh, that allows the vendors to optimize their op operations uh, and it has it, it has you know all the endpoints from managing product catalog uploading new products all the way to order management and order fulfillment so it's kind of the complete solution and one-stop solution for different channels we have integration with all the major marketplaces so for somebody who's looking to enter into e-commerce and sell it's very easy for them to do so um, we have another product another subsidiary by the name freight club um, freight club is how we call it the expedia of shipping <laughs> of freight um, so we have very strong influential um, connections with the carrier networks in primarily in us that's where our uh, client base is where that's where most of our customers are um, and for for a fee we help provide 
those freight services, those competitive rates to other businesses who are looking to ship their products. So that's kind of the idea there. Uh, other than that, um, I also am a regulated Canadian immigration consultant. So I have my own firm and in my own practice, and I've been practicing for about two plus years now. Um, and you may be wondering well, how this is even relevant to what I do in day to day world. Um, I think for me, it it is relevant because I'm trying to find the application of technology in immigration sector. Now, there's there's two ways to do it. Either I be in that industry and I understand how it works and where the gaps are and how technology can help, or uh, I can be an outsider and probably, you know, have focus groups and whatnot. So I chose the first approach and that's kind of where I'm also focusing on trying to find how uh, technology can help uh, Canadian immigration system and in the way, of course, simplifying uh, Canadian immigration law for for my clients. It was all there in the slides, but that's kind of the gist of it. <laughs> Moving on to, you know, the the inspiration um, for this whole topic. I know it's pretty old school and a lot of you may be wondering, you know, in this age of machine learning and AI driven testing technology, why are we talking about um, exploratory testing? The inspiration for this topic came from a project that my son did as part of his grade four um, projects. So I, I, I studied in India and I, I do not know much about the Canadian history. Uh, and you know the key important um, people that uh, need recognition or, or command recognition. I, I have no idea. So uh, when my son was assigned this project, it was right beginning of you know end of February, beginning of March, and um, he was tasked to prepare uh, almost like a news report on this person. And I had never heard this person's name before. So when I started um, learning more about David Thompson, that was the name of the explorer, uh, it turned out like he had quite a history and it was really, really exciting for me to learn it. And simply put, he was a he was an explorer um, at the age of 14. He joined the Hudson Bay Company, the company that we all know still exists um, as an apprentice. And over time, he grew out to be this great explorer that he was. Um, during the course of his career, he was tasked by his employers to explore new trade routes uh, through all of Canada, um, mostly let's not limiting to Canada, but North America. And that was what led him to explore different territories. And in the process, he mapped over 3.9 million square kilometers. Uh, his maps are still used at the, as the basis for a lot of Canadian um, um, government tasks. So not a, not a history lesson, but just a little bit about why this kind of topic came into mind. And I'm like, okay, let's maybe become an explorer and maybe we can touch upon the exploratory testing a little bit in the session this month. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of where it came from. Uh, coming back to the topic, um, there are different definitions um, that we can see in literature, if you do a quick search online, there are different ways how we try to explain what exploratory testing is. Um, I, I just took a few that stood out for me and also some that you know we would follow as a standard. Um, the first one is from ISTQB and it talks about um, exploratory testing being this informal test design technique where tester actively controls the design of the tests. Um, the second definition is from Kemp Kena, and as I was doing more research, seems like he is quite a well-known person um, in the evolution of software testing as it stands right now. Um, and back in 1980s is where you know he coined this this definition that we see on the screen. Exploratory testing, as per him, is a style of software testing that emphasizes is the personal freedom and responsibility of the individual tester to optimize their quality of work. And it talks about this approach being, you know, all about learning, um, about test design, execution, test result interpretation is equally important as well, and that these activities run in parallel throughout the project. Um, I think the short and sweet definition that does it for me and explains what we need to is the third one, which is exploratory testing is simultaneously learning, test design, and test execution. So that kind of, you know, just shows this, uh, the same test approach being described differently and what it means in different contexts. And 
probably it has to do with when it was defined, like if it was designed uh, defined quite early uh, when this process was still being formulated, probably it's more primitive, but probably more updated now. Why do we need uh, exploratory testing? It's quite interesting. I think for me, I'm a big fan of exploratory testing. Um, I have designed my software testing processes in a way where we are able to kind of have a mix of uh, scripted test approach and some sort of uh, exploratory testing approach as well. Because for me, from what I've seen based on what I have learned, it's really helped. Just trying to make this case a little bit more, uh, talking about why do we think or why do I think it's really, really important that we still do exploratory testing is me trying to go back to the basics and what I would refer to is one of the seven principles of software testing, which is the pesticide paradox. Um, the term, like I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, where it comes from is the fact that if the farmer uses the same pesticide every time, the bugs would get um, accustomed to it and they would develop resistance to that pesticide and the pesticide is no longer effective, in which case the farmer would need to switch. Uh, the chemicals that he's using. The same applies for software testing. If the same set of repetitive tests are run all over again, eventually they will lose relevance and they will no longer be able to find new defects. Usually the strategy to overcome this is to uh, make sure the test cases are reviewed regularly uh, and revised so that they don't go stale, they're still relevant and whatnot. Uh, the other uh, approach... Uh, sorry, did somebody... Sorry, looks like uh, someone needs to mute. Yeah. OK, OK, I will just keep going. All right, so uh, yeah, so talking a little bit about the pesticide paradox, um, I was talking about the strategies to overcome this. And as I mentioned, one of the strategies is to review the test cases so that they are current, they're not stale, they're still relevant to the context of um, whatever the application and test is. Or the other approach is from time to time, we do change or tweak our test approach as well. And adding unscripted test approaches like exploratory testing in the mix does help from what I've seen and what I've experienced in the projects that my team has executed. Another interesting um, analogy I found when I was um, just doing research to create the slides is the minefield uh, analogy. It's, it's just interesting because I never thought of it this way. Now, when we look at what's on your screen, you, you're seeing the red lines where, you know, seems like there are mines, but seems like, you know, they are paths that people have tried and tested. And there are some undiscovered defects highlighted in the in the um, in the draft uh, like sketch that's on your screen. Now, think of it this way. If you think about the question, what is the best way to cross a minefield? Well, if you ask me the best way, I'm probably thinking of the safer way because I want to make it the other side alive. Um, so my answer would be to follow exactly the same sequence of steps uh, somebody of somebody who's done it before successfully. So I would probably follow, you know, the red kind of lines. Uh, I may may uncover some defects. I may not, but I would be probably, you know, staying on course and just following a path that's already taken. Now, that is not what most of us testers are, we are dangerous, right? Like we live to life, we want to live life dangerously. So if we equate defect to, you know, visualize that as being a mine, we want to find each one of them. So really we want to hit something and it blows up. That's what we really want to find. Um, so while we want to be safe, we also want to take a little bit of challenge and be a bit, bit more creative and find those mines uh, that could ruin our app application or limit the functionality or impact the functionality and impact our end users in the meanwhile. Also, just continuing to advocate for the relevance of exploratory testing in this age and time. Um, if you are looking to formulate an effective test strategy, you need a test strategy that answers two questions. And those two questions that I'm going to talk about, they are almost like, you know, the two sides of the coin. Uh, one 
cannot be effective by itself. So what I'm talking about is the first question that the test strategy would need to address is, does the software behave as intended? Um, now that intention of how this or the expected behavior that's sometimes documented, sometimes it's not documented, uh, but in general, um, this is where, you know, scripted tests or whether they're manual or automated would be used to check if the software is behaving as intended. Um, and it would be with di within defined parameters, con conditions and configurations. The other question to also think of is, are there any risks? This is where I believe exploratory testing can help. Uh, tests can be designed and executed on the fly, almost like executing tiny experiments on the fly. So we mix something, we see if it blows up, not if not, we change and you know we do the same experiment again. Um, yeah, it reminds me of Mr. Bean going back to his the episode where he goes back to his school and he ends up turning blue, like making some like he does something in the chem lab and it uh, everybody turns blue. In, including a kid that's in there. But yeah, that's kind of where my mind went. Uh, but we need more experiments like that, I think, to get deeper into how the application is behaving. So as, as I see it, uh, two important sides of testing are checking the software is working as intended and if there are any risks. And for a successful outcome, I would say a comprehensive test strategy would need to include a little bit of both, um, neither checking or exploring by itself, would just be sufficient on its own. Again, it's very context driven, uh, but what I believe is that, you know, we would need to have a little bit of both to have a very successful test strategy. Just to kind of summarize the value add that uh, we've seen um, over the course of time being added by exploratory testing is that it can help fill the gaps that are uh, left by running the scripted tests. It can also um, be helpful in instances, and this is, you know, uh, something I talked about in one of my previous um, speaking engagements. Uh, I talked about testing without requirements. And really, if we don't have requirements and we don't really know what the software is supposed to do, we just explore. That's the first step for us to get to know the system. And then we observe and then we make an assessment whether that is the expected behavior or do we need to or is that a defect and something that needs to be addressed? Uh, so it's very, very useful in scenarios where we don't have much documented knowledge for the application under test. And also it helps us learn and observe the behavior of our application under test in a more, I would say, unrestricted way where you can touch any button you want to. You can, I don't know, click any button any number of times. You can just navigate on your free will as you decide on the fly without much restriction. Um, so it, it really helps, I think, as a tester for us to connect better with the application under test to understand it a bit more. Now, we did talk about why we think it's it's still important and still relevant at this age and time to have uh, exploratory testing approach for your projects. Uh, let's touch a little bit about you know, how we do it. Explore like an explorer. Um, don't be unprepared. Uh, prepare for it like an explorer would. Again, I'm just you know, going back to what I read about David Thompson and him exploring this major part of North America and mapping it uh, at the same time. Uh, sometimes he used to take his wife and kids along that exploration journey, sometimes not, but I think he went prepared. He had enough help to, you know, make sure he was able to achieve what was uh, the original intent of the journey. Uh, so just kind of trying to focus life like an explorer, have a specific goal in mind. Um, I know there are a lot of literature in which we talk about exploratory testing being, you know, almost like opening floodgates. You just kind of go unrestricted and you, you know, uh, start interacting with different parts of the application. Uh, but then from what personally I have experienced is that it's easy to get distracted and lose sight of what I was originally intent to doing with this session. So it's I think it's we will touch upon how to kind of stay focused and stay true to the objective of what we're trying to achieve um, a little bit later. But uh, I think having a specific goal in mind is really, really important. Um, 
and that's where you know I'm trying to compare ourselves with some explorer trying to find on a mission to find defects or try on a mission to break the software, which I really enjoy doing. Um, I was actually working on some project, and I think uh, I I didn't have much requirements for that, so I did enter a bunch of garbage data. So I I did put in you know I don't know question marks where date of birth should be and things like that, and um. I was supposed to kind of, you know, it's so it was like almost like a CRM where a uh, user would have a certain kind of interaction and, and then you would log in on the admin side and do a bunch of things. And then when I tried logging in, it didn't work. It gave like a very random kind of, um, you know, the yellow screen error where something broke. It was an exception. God knows what it was. And I turned around and I told my husband, I was like, you know what? I think I broke it. Um, I may not have. I don't know. <laughs> We are still trying to find out, but that 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 was my that was my feelings back then when I was when I observed what happened with all that I did. Uh, but anyhow, coming back to the topic, uh, prepare for the adventure. Uh, I think be ready to be amazed, be ready to be surprised, and just keep an open mind uh, when going when when starting this activity. And bring along help and supplies. Probably, you know, uh, stay hydrated. Um, and supplies like probably test data would help. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, I'm just going to interrupt you for one sec. Uh, we have a sure. question in the chat. Uh -huh. uh, so Mikhail wanted to know, do you differentiate between ad hoc and exploratory testing? You know what? I was probably... 100% sure this question is going to come up. So I did look it up this time. Uh, I think uh, this question was asked to me sometime like in previous sessions as well. So I did try to look into the uh, literature available for this. And what I could understand is the exploratory testing stands apart from the other terminology like ad hoc, like monkey testing, uh, from the aspect that exploratory testing is intended to learn the product. And that's really the only uh, difference I could find between exploratory testing and the other ones that I listed. Uh, I also did find one more um, differentiating factor where somebody did mention that uh, exploratory testing is more, uh, I would say, um, long-term, while ad hoc testing is very uh, short-term uh, for a very kind of focused area of application. Now for me really it is like tomato tomato like I have been really really conflicted. I've been trying to find more information because I somehow in my gut knew this is going to be talked about again um, and really um, what I'm finding is that there's no good source of information or probably I haven't found it yet for me to confidently differentiate between all these different test approaches that are popping up. Um, also the one the information that was available, it is almost like it's been put out to sort of upsell a certain approach while trying to downplay the other one. So, for example, this one um, one article talked about monkey testing being an insult to monkeys because they are not going to like it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just trying to find out the difference between the actual difference between these approaches and some people got it uh, were talking about how it's offending to talk about exploratory testing as unstructured because it does require a lot of skill like everybody's right in their own way but really I think uh, the only differentiating factors I could find is the fact that exploratory testing is more about learning and interacting and observing while ad hoc is more um, about breaking uh, the application but again that's what I could find, and I'm still learning. So if I find more information, I can share it with the team. But that's what I know as of right now. I was looking it up last night as well, but it's just very, like, there aren't many good sources of information available. And, yeah, it's just hard to find something that's, like, convincingly good. And I'm like, ah, now I get it. I haven't reached that point yet with ad hoc and exploratory and, yeah, with monkey testing and then all the other ones that seemingly are, closer in approaches similar to each other. Sorry, I was not able to answer that fully, but that's what I know. <laughs> OK, awesome. All right. Um, 
getting back. Um, right. OK, here. So um, also talking about exploring with the purpose. Um, this is a very interesting visual I found in one of the books. I'll, I'll, I'll share the book a title and the author uh, a little bit later in the slides. Um, so this this uh, visual talks about. You know. Time spent wondering and the insight a person has um, just before we talk about this a little bit more. This is created by Jessica Hagee. I'm not sure if more more people are familiar with it. I only came to know about this person about Jessica Hagee and her designing these almost like three by five index cards and, and organizing them in a blog format and them being so effective that it conveys the message. It tells stories, you know, their jokes there. It talks about life lessons in a very similar manner. And in this um, index card, really, what she's trying to portray is that if you meander without direction or purpose, you will spend a lot of time wondering and with little in insight, really, essentially you are lost. While we are exploring the software, we, we don't want to be lost. We want to be here exploring, which means we are going to spend a lot of time uh, wondering, but we will do it with a purpose. There'll be an insight. There'll be a method to the madness. And that's where I think that's where we would be focusing more on the process that we're going to talk about in the next slide. Uh, this process is something that, again, is probably what I have observed, um, not set in stone. Please uh, feel to modify uh, the learnings or the takeaways from this session and then apply it to your business uh, business needs or your uh, application needs as you seem fit. From what I could understand, if I have to formalize the process and sort of you know try and explain the different steps that would be included in there, this is how I would list down the different steps um, for exploratory testing to general steps, starting with creating a test charter uh, and then preparing for the test, uh, executing them, of course, uh, observing, evaluating and then documenting the learnings. We, we look into each one of them a little bit in more detail. Creating the test charter. Um, so test charter is a is a statement of test objectives and possible test ideas. Um, I haven't uh, created test charter myself. Like we usually go by, like we, we make it part of the test plan. So I haven't tried it personally, but for me, it's more like not having a formal document, but like a statement that keeps us focused, that keeps us grounded and true to what we are trying to achieve with this exercise. So um, a regular format, or a general format for a test charter would be explore module XYZ to discover whatever it is you would like to discover, whether it's instances, edge cases, whatever that would be. So the first two uh, examples here, uh, those are examples of a test charter that you can have for kind of uh, channeling or focusing uh, for the duration of the test session. Now, uh, talking about the third one, the way it is described, it is very, very specific. There's not enough room for creativity or for designing on the fly test because it is very, very specific. So that's not a really good example of how a test charter could be written. The next one is actually too broad. Um, talking about exploring all websites to find all possible security vulnerabilities is probably not going to keep the tester on track. It's very easy to be distracted and, you know, um, kind of getting too curious about the module that probably doesn't need attention right now. So it's it's important to define the test charter in a way where it's still lean, um, but still gives some sort of a, a guidance for the tester to stay within that parameters and. Uh, run the tests on the fly. Preparing for the test is very similar to how you would prepare, prepare for any other scripted test as well. It's about making sure you have the environment that's ready. Um, the changes are deployed, the ones that you're trying to test. Um, the test data is available. Um, there's a decision of whether the person would be testing solo or is it more like pair testing? Uh, is there going to be a time box? Is it an open ended activity? Uh, we can take as much time as we want. I wish, but we most often don't have a luxury. We probably have a couple of hours, if at all, a day to kind of spend exploring the application a little bit. But that these are all the things that are part of the test preparation phase. 
much sim uh, similar to the other test uh, cycles as well, uh, test approaches as well. Um, after we are prepped and ready to go, we, we are clear on the objective. The next step is to execute the test. Um, and the execution, as we did briefly discuss before, um, is mostly, uh, I would say, on the fly. I won't use the word random. Uh, it is on the fly. So we do we do a step or we touch something or we click something and we're like, hmm, OK, let me see what happens if I do this. So this is where, you know, I am thinking on the fly and I am staying true to the objective, but I'm still trying to, um, I would say, devise those test scenarios um, on the spot. And then I'm following each of those pathways to see if I find something. Uh, observing. So observation is really, really important. We need to have good observation of whatever pops up because uh, if it was a regular approach, like a standard scripted approach, uh, we sort of know what the expected behavior is. We may find um, you know bugs on the way, but really when we are exploring, we don't know what we are going to find, uh, which means we have to keep an open mind. We probably have to I don't know, um, open the console uh, or look for error logs as I'm interacting with the application in parallel to see if there's um, uh, something that, you know, I'm clicking and it's probably not registering or, hey, I created an account, but it doesn't show in the database. Is there a job? Is there, it, does it go, is it done in batches? Like all these questions are uh, what would help you learn the application better. And it, it helps, I think, at the end of the day, all these observations, if channeled the right way, can help make a very good uh, product for a customer. Uh, evaluate the results. So while evaluating the results, think about if the behavior you're seeing is correct or not. Um, it's very hard to define correct when there is undocumented requirement, uh, sorry, undocumented knowledge. So we don't really know what it's supposed to do, but clearly like if something like what you see on your screen is happening, it's, it's probably wrong. So that's where I think the expertise and the skill set of the tester also comes handy. We always think about the customer, the end user trying to use this application, and we also kind of tap into our knowledge of the industry standards, uh, the general rules, uh, what are some things that the applications are never supposed to do, are always supposed to do. For example, you know, having customer friendly error messages so that they can go back and fix what they want. That's probably, you know, something that an application should be doing regardless of whether that is captured in the um, documentation or not. Um, and then, you know, we evaluate um, whatever we are seeing, um, if that needs further discussion, then we channel it to the right uh, team members. Uh, it could be if, if it's an observation and we are not quite sure what the behavior should be, uh, that's an opportunity to connect with the product team and you know share findings with them and see if that is something that needs to be fixed for a customer or if this is something that you know we agree on that something we need to improve on or if it's something that's clearly clearly um, unexpected behavior um, to channel it to the dev team to actually fix it um, and then in either way we are all aiming to build quality products by finding uh, by learning more about them and by connecting with them document learnings um, it's quite a lean slide like um, I know documentation is not one of the key attributes uh, of exploratory testing. Um, I feel that some sort of a documentation, even if it's like quick notes about what was observed, helps. Uh, also, because it's easier to pass on to the product team if it's asynchronous communication, like, hey, you know, these are the 10 things I observed, uh, forwarding it to the product team to take a look and then we can discuss more. Or uh, if it's, um, you know, a bunch of defects, then they would go to the dev team or they would go into the defect management system, wherever, whatever you're using um, to notify the developers of the defects, and then uh, it would follow the life cycle there. Yeah, so a bit of an example, and, and I have a lot of examples of exploratory testing because um, I think for us, we um, 
as I mentioned, our company was founded in 2004. We deal with a lot of legacy code. The people who designed that product, that application are no longer with Cymax. Um, sometimes we have, you know, um, code that has been untouched for like more than a decade. We don't really know what it does. So a lot of times when we start thinking about changing the product, the first thing we do is we try and explore it. Um, and that's why for us, we rely not quite heavily but we still rely on exploratory testing a lot especially if we are dealing with legacy piece of code um so a couple of years ago we had to uh the, there was a project to actually change the website checkout page from a single page as it was before to a multi-page um, checkout process where probably one page has i don't know shipping address the other page has payment info and so multiple steps uh so we did get sort of the acceptance criteria and it, it was very basic. The customer should be able to check out. They should be able to upgrade the shipping if they want, you know, um, like like how you say um, expedited shipping or if they want free shipping and they're OK to wait for a couple of days, they can kind of make that decision. Uh, the customer would be expected to pay applicable tax and shipping charges, if any. And uh, of course, one of the acceptance criteria, they should get some sort of a confirmation notification that they've placed the order successfully for us. Seems quite easy, right? Like what can go wrong? But for this project, we actually ended up reporting 250 bugs across different websites. It was for different websites that we were um, testing this project for. Um, and the areas where we saw a lot of bugs come in were actually from the fact that the triggers and validations that were seemingly on one page did not transfer well when we split them across multiple pages. So think of it this way. You're putting all the information on this one page. You click place order and all the validations that need to happen happen. Uh, let's say we check if the item is in stock, still in stock. Uh, if the prices change from we, we change price every 15 minutes. Uh, we have very dynamic pricing. Is the price change significantly? Uh, or, you know, is there anything else we need to be aware of? Uh, any challenges with the address, like all those validations and triggers, they happen at the time when somebody click place order. Now imagine splitting that trigger and those validations across multiple pages and then deciding what should be triggered when uh, to ensure a smooth customer journey. And that's where we found, you know, a lot of those uh, defects coming up. Um, and really for us, we didn't have a reference point. Uh, all we had was the old checkout page. This is how it works. Here you go. This is the new one. Let us know what needs fixing, right? So it's, it's about that. Uh, the other area that we saw uh, a lot of defects coming from is the fact that it was legacy code. Uh, and the, for the changes to be reflected, they had to be done on multiple pages. So we had, you know, multiple versions of headers, footers, um, or, you know, I don't know, multiple versions of uh, same classes or same code line. And for us, like it was very hard to assess, OK, if we comment out this one, the other piece is still going to work because it seems like it's redundant. We were not able to make the assessment back then but because it was legacy code. So it took a lot of hit and trial for us to get it right. But that's an example where, you know, we found immense success and something that um, gives to show that for a project where we don't have much to begin with, uh, this approach really, really is helpful. OK, so talking about the lessons um, learned or some observations, I would say. Uh, so what do we ne need to know? So if we are planning to do it or if we are doing it already, what do we need to be aware of? Uh, think of your test approach as, you know, the spectrum that you see on your screen. You either have, so I've actually encountered uh, organizations or, uh, you know, testers that work on either extreme spectrum, and which is okay because that's how the business is. Uh, quite recently, I actually saw a job description, and I can't remember which company it was for, or whether it was for a job in Canada, but it talked about uh, if you're a tester who likes to make test cases, this job is not for you. You know, we want somebody who can do minimal documentation and focus 100% on the test. We don't want, you know, somebody going through the, the test plans and telling us how much is executed. We just want to find good bugs. And if that's, 
you know, what you can do for us, then apply. And it, it was really interesting because I have never seen this kind of um, creative job posting before. Uh, but yeah, so I have I have um, come across uh, organizations, businesses, and testers that are either side of the spectrum. Uh, if you are planning to use this approach or do, if you have projects uh, that repeatedly warrant the use of either one or both of these approaches, um, I would say that you are looking at, you know, a hybrid approach. Um, so somewhere in the spectrum, you'll find the right hybrid or solo approach uh, based on your business needs and the application under test. So it doesn't, it's not a one solution fit all, and it's very context driven, and it really depends on, um, other than I know time is always a constraint, but it really depends on the application under test and how much we know about it to decide if this is a good approach to follow for that or not. Um, I've, I've mentioned this multiple times uh, in, in our uh, in our talk today, but in the right context, exploratory testing can be highly effective, while in some cases, probably not so much. The example I uh, took is of a medical device and a video game. So if you're testing a medical device, we know it's quite high risk. Uh, it requires high level of documentation. It requires very high precision. And for that, it makes sense to have, you know, scripted tests where we are documenting the outcome. Uh, we have, you know, specified data sets, configuration and parameters that we would be following. It makes makes a lot of sense there. Uh, with let's say an example of testing video games. It is equally challenging not try to underplay or undersell what um, the application there does, but it does require, um, I would say a more fluid approach um, because I think like it's it's about how you would interact with the game and you know what you would do, let's say if it's with a lot of characters, you know, what does that shape out to be and things like that. So there's a lot more, I would say openness um, in what we can do in terms of testing and interacting with the application in there. Also, let's say if you are um, in a scenario where, uh, let's say you're doing user acceptance testing and there's a high degree of guidance that's required to perform the test, uh, then in that case, um, scripted tests are more beneficial than exploratory testing. So it's, it's all about the context. Mind maps. So um, mind maps, are visual thinking tools. I have thought so many times to use them because for me, I have those, you know, those wave of ideas. I'd be like, oh, oh, what if I do this? Oh, like, what if I do this? And it just is like too much to handle and map and still try to um, stay on course. Uh, so I usually, I just tend to make notes. I haven't really visualized my thought process as a mind map does, but uh, from, my interaction with other people, my mind maps do help people visualize uh, their thought process and it allows them to uh, plan and organize and, you know, just, I would say, organize their ideas more effectively. And from the looks of it, they are quite lean. They don't take much time. They don't take much space. It's it's like quick and effective way to just map out what your thought process is. Probably easier said than done. If your mind's kind of running in 100 different directions when you look at uh, look at a software. So for me, I think I go into a moment of like, oh my God, what did we get ourselves into? The moment I see an application that is very, very glitchy, uh, the behavior is erratic and that's when like, okay, great, this is going to be one bumpy ride. So for me, I get distracted because I start self-doubting each and every component and I'm like, okay, now that this is not working, let me go check how is this behaving and this behaving? So it, it's very easy to get sidetracked. Um, and I think something to bring back the focus to the objective of running that test is important, whether you call it the test charter, whether we use some sort of mind map to be um, just consciously be able to kind of pull ourselves back to where we need to be. Uh, anything that works for you or your team is, is, is a good way to do it. Just touching briefly upon uh, the advantages of using this technique, and I've talked about some of them already. Um, so project owners can get insights that are not possible to get with other scripted test techniques, because usually how it starts is we would have the requirements, the devs would use those requirements to create the product or create the feature, and then the testing team would also tap into those requirements. And then 
uh, test the same application um, to avoid tunnel vision. I always, always ask my team to go above and beyond and not, you know, just be uh, following the same chain of thought the entire rest of the team is following. And that one way to do it is through exploring the application a little bit further. Uh, and it helps uncover defects or edge case or scenarios that um, if they're addressed, they really, really have a great impact on our customers. Um, and this is where we are working directly with the product owners to get them insights that were not possible through traditional or descriptive test approaches. Uh, we can achieve more on tight deadlines than structured testing, um, just purely by the fact of less overhead, I would say, because we are not really formally creating the test cases. We are not really formally um, creating exhaustive test plans. A lot of things are being done on the fly, and that's where I think it reduces the overhead, and it appears like it is a better approach to follow if you're limited on time. But again, it's very context-driven, probably not a good idea if, let's say for the medical instruments, like probably not a good idea to follow it, despite whatever the uh, deadline would be for the timing. Uh, very little preparation time is needed. I mean, the whole idea is to explore. So all you need is to just prep for it, um, be ready to change your perspective, and then, I mean, you're ready whenever you're ready. Beneficial to find usability issues. So that's where when you're interacting with the software and you're observing how it behaves, um, there is potential to uncover, uncover uh, or find usability issues that could be addressed um, in the product or the application under test. It can also help discover previously unknown edge cases. So um, what I always struggle with is, uh, so there's like, it happens more than one time actually. Um, my team would create a defect and next thing you know, it would be closed as won't fix because hey, it's a data issue or it's invalid because never in a lifetime we are gonna get data like that. And what I go back to the project manager managers and say is, you know what, I see it as an unhandled exception. So there's a data set that came in, the application didn't know what to do with it, and it crashed. So it is an unhandled exception. And that's where, you know, there's a healthy debate, let's call it that, that happens. But at the end of the day, it makes the product better. But yeah, it's like eliminating like a data issue or like understanding that this is an unhandled scenario that needs to be handled in the next release. Okay, um, yeah, and uh, as I mentioned, it can also be used in areas or in um, scenarios or projects where we do have lack of documented knowledge. Uh, there we start by learning more about what we are changing and then, you know, we uh, design a test approach accordingly. In terms of the disadvantages, um, not to say that yeah. this is Perfect. Yeah. Can I interrupt you one quick second? There's a question sure. here. Okay. Yeah, um, go ahead. So the question is when you choose the hybrid approach as a team, would you recommend a dedicated exploratory tester and dedicated scripted tester within the same project? Or would you recommend every tester just think as a hybrid tester? Um, I would say it's 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 a very good question. I think it has to do with um, how the team is structured and how how many resources you have at your disposal and also about the skill set. Uh, so let's say, for example, I have a combination of in-house test leads for different work streams and I have an offshore team that does the more detailed scripted testing. So the part part of what my leads do, my test leads do is exploratory testing. So the scripted testing is handled by somebody else in the team. Uh, and then another person who also knows the product, but is not really following any kind of um, scripted approach would do the um, exploratory testing. Sometimes I do it and I try and see if I can break it because I still have a little bit of tester left in me. So if I have time, uh, I, I do it too. So for me, I have decentralized that for more effectiveness because I found it hard to have the same person follow 10, 10 test scenarios and then turn around and say, okay, you know, I'm going to forget about them. Now I'm going to go explore. I haven't been able to find that balance in a single um, 
a tester yet, at least the one that I have in my team. So I've decided to split it. So I still follow a hybrid approach, but for different resources and with each uh, tester in that project having a role to play in that. Um, but it also at the end of the day depends on how your QA team is structured, what your release process looks like um, and your business needs as well. Um, like, you know, this company that I was talking about that has a job posting saying that from what I understood, they are looking for people who would do unstructured testing. If that is the role, then all the person is doing is doing the unstructured testing, in which case they are on the other side of the spectrum, which is fully uh, exploratory. So it, it, I, I think it, that hybrid, that sweet spot is for you guys to find based on your business needs and based on what you know in terms of the skill set and the QA resources you have available. Hope that answers the question. OK, all right, I'll, I'll just uh, carry on and we'll have more time for questions at the end as well. Uh, talking about uh, the uh, the challenges that we may run into. Um, this approach, as we talked about, it's it's quite fluid, it's it's quite, um, you know, I make it up as I go kind of a thing, so it's difficult to document. Uh, um, it's very hard for me to have like a two hour session and then come back and write, oh, actually, you know what? I think I went to this module first and then I went to this one. It's very hard to document things like these. Um, if we are thinking on our feet um, and trying to get through the session and trying to achieve the objective that we are. Um, and also it's, as I mentioned multiple times before, it's very easy to steer off course. For me, I am off course the moment I find the software is very, very bad quality. And it has happened to me multiple times and I'm like, okay, this is gonna need some, you know, heavy duty <laughs> testing, um, but it's, it's easy to get distracted. Um, because it's on the spot as well. So it's not that something that we've kind of thought about it multiple times and we've rehearsed it and we kind of come back and do the drill. It's not that. Um, it is also limited by testers, skills and experience. Um, there, there are some areas where it does take a little bit of an expertise to understand whether that is a behavior that's noteworthy or something that needs to be explored a little bit further. Or is that something that, you know, is not something that we would be focusing on or is that not relevant to what we are doing so it does take a little bit of judgment it does take a lot of skill to develop uh, i would say it's almost like a science experiment i would call it you try and blow something up if it works great then you find what else we can what 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 other damage is done if not then we move on to the next or uh, next uh, step or we try to tweak our approach and see what happens so it's i would say very very um close to what we could call like a science <laughs> i would say science experiment um and that's where i think having somebody who's really skilled in thinking on on the fly and you know being able to kind of you know change gears and uh change the perspective and not be stuck in the tunnel vision and still not be you know steered off the course i think it does take a lot of uh skill and experience and probably a little bit of discipline as well to get the most out of uh the experience here it's uh, sometimes difficult to determine which tests are already executed because if I'm not kind of, you know, in my mind, like I I'm going through a bunch of different um, functionalities that I'm interacting with, if I'm not writing anything down at the end of the day, I can't really tell you, okay, you know, this is something I've done. This is something that's pending. It's very hard to keep track uh, in the moment of time. Um, and sometimes because, again, we are not documenting, we are not following any um, specified approach, sometimes it takes time to determine if that what you found is a defect or, uh, you know, I would say whether a test has fa passed or failed. And also to say a lot of people, uh, exploratory testing is not for everybody. 
Uh, some people are not interested in how this approach works. They're not a fan of it, which is fine as well. Um, there's there's no good or bad approach. It really what what works for the application, whatever works for the business, is the right approach to follow. And uh, it also depends on depends on the interest uh, level. For me, I have a lot of uh, some some QAs are really really keen on exploratory testing, and sometimes they come up with the bugs where, you know, we all are scratching our head and we're like how did this person even get to this module to find you know whatever was happening there but it's amazing what it can uncover and um like there, there was this uh, person uh back when our team was smaller i was also doing a lot of testing myself uh mostly the exploratory bits uh because i was coming it uh, coming at it from a fresher perspective compared to my team who was like in the moment part of the team and closely working with the team um i I was just, you know, interacting with this application and I did a couple of, you know, back browser um, clicks and I did something and then God knows how many steps I followed and finally an error popped up. And then I, for the life of me, could not like remember how to do it, but I just took a screenshot and I showed it to the developer and he's like, he's like, uh, I want this tester on my team and I'm like, this is me. This is the tester, but I don't know how to do it again. Can you like see how we can, how did we actually arrive at it? Because I'm not able to replicate it, but it's been interesting. A uh, lot of things, a lot of interesting issues we found, a lot of defects that we still scratch our head for. Like how in the world did we even find what we were finding? But uh, it's it, it's interesting. But again, it's not for everybody. It's context driven, and whatever works for one doesn't work for everyone. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's the challenge for other test approaches as well. Okay. Um, closing notes. I can't believe we went through all of this um, already. But just to kind of sum up, you know, and have some uh, things for you guys to ponder upon or probably explore more about um, just kind of closing off by reiterating the my, my favorite definition from what I could find which was really short very effective and kind of is a good example a uh, good explanation of or good definition of what exploratory testing is um, comes from uh, James Pat uh, regarding exploratory testing is simultaneous learning test design and test execution now talking about the next point uh, and this is just a summary so we've talked about these points before but these are just you know some some takeaways or some things to think about talking again about the pesticide paradox where if we follow the same scripted test approaches we may no longer find new bugs and this is come you know going back to the basics one of the principles of software testing if you remember we talked about two sides of the coin so two sides of the coin, one being checking if the software is working as intended and the other one about exploring for risk. And for a successful outcome, uh, we would ideally have to include both, neither just checking by itself or exploring by itself will be sufficient. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of, again, depends on the scenario, depends on what we have in hand. Um, it's also a reasonable conclusion that in the right context, exploratory testing can be highly effective, while in others, not so effective. And uh, don't forget to explore like an explorer. Be prepared, live dangerously, go find all the bugs you have to find. Um, yeah, and uh, bring help. Just be a good explorer. Remember David Thompson if you want to look him up. Customize the test approach according to your business needs and that's where I keep emphasizing that let's say whatever my experience has been uh, you may not have the same experience because of maybe the nature of the projects or uh, maybe because you know uh, you have a different level of documentation maturity for the product that you are testing um, so the rule of thumb is really to customize the test approach according to your business needs. So somewhere in the spectrum between that fully scripted and fully exploratory is where you would find, you know, that right kind of sp sweet spot for the project that you are working on. And it may vary from um, project to project, from application to application. Um, in general, exploratory testing can be an effective way to test in the absence of documented knowledge um, and create new tests if the old ones grow stale and um, yeah uh, 
probably effective if the time is limited, although it's debatable, I'm not 100% agreeing with that, but probably I'm assuming it's because of the lesser overhead that comes with this test approach, less documentation and such. And also it helps us in learning about the item under test really quickly. I have one more slide to talk about, and that's probably, you know, looking into the future. Now, the traditional exploratory approach, we did talk about it. It's manual. It's very, very, I would say, um, person uh, tested driven, depends on their skill set, depends on their expertise, depends on how passionate they, uh, they are or, you know, how they would like to run. So it's, it's very, very, I would say, um, different in different scenarios. If we have to look into the future a little bit, I think um, it is with all the changes and all the amount of work that's been gone into, you know, artificial intelligence, space testing tools uh, that may or may not use machine learning. Um, I mean, there's a lot that has been already applied. It's it's out there for people to use. Um, you know, hypotheses are being proven. Uh, they are very effective tools uh, in some cases. But again, um, at the end of the day, for me, the question still remains, can we realistically kind of, you know, um, do away with how critically human brain thinks when they're testing? Can we like replicate that, uh, you know, via our computer uh, algorithm or maybe, you know, have the algorithm learn how the brain thinks critically when they are testing? I think for me, I still have to see more about what's coming to be confident that this is something that, you know, would be the future. And in the future, we would have automated, we would have something like automated exploratory testing, which would be very close to what we have in terms of what we are able to achieve manually. Um, so it, it remains to be seen. I'm, I'm a hopeless optimist, very optimistic about the future and what it holds for us, but it still remains to be seen that if it's indeed a reality, um, that it would truly, truly happen. Maybe there's a solution that if we are able to kind of, you know, um, put it down, I would say, um, as some sort of, a, if we are able to put it down as a logic, maybe we would be able to replicate it. But again, uh, this is an area that I'm still learning about um, and excited to learn about how AI-driven uh, testing tools and um, that are powered with or without machine learning, how can they help kind of be that new era for testing? Uh, that's, I would say, not far away. It's, it's, it's on the horizon for sure. So, um, yeah, uh, I was talking about this book earlier. You may remember the visual that I picked it up. Um, I, I did mention that I picked it up from a book, and this is the book that I was talking about. Um, this book is close to me, not because of the author, but because this book was introduced um, when I gave my first talk ever in one of the local testing meetups. And for me, it is more nostalgic because this was the first time I presented and I was able to like I it, it was a competition and I had the best talk and I got it. I actually have it. I was reading through it when I was I'm not trying to like oh, yeah, my my system is blur. Um, my screen is blurred. I'm not trying to publicize the book, but I think it was really really interesting for me to read it. Also, as I was researching more about the topic, it does touch upon very old school methods and examples like this. So the author talked about one example where, um, when she was t running the software, launching the software she noticed the hard disk was spinning or the floppy drive didn't have the installer. And I was like, whoa, like it took me way back to, you know, when I was in college, not to give out my age, but, you know, way back when things were different. Um, and, you know, I had my first project, my college project in a floppy that I was, you know, giving a demo for. So I just way, went way back. So it was very, very interesting for me to kind of read it, probably a little bit old school, but the concepts in there are very, very well explained um, and very good uh, content in there. Cool. OK, so moving on. Question and answer time. I am a big fan of Big Bang Theory. It's one of my favorite series. Uh, it appeals to the nerd in me. My husband hates it. Uh, I like it. So some some light humor 
before we end the session today. That's all from my side. Thank you so much, Miha. Yeah, so if there's any questions at this point, uh, feel free to raise your hand and you can ask that aloud or you can put it in the chat. Uh, we did have some also some nice comments in the chat as well. I'll let you read through on your own. I didn't want to interrupt you earlier with those. Oh, nice. It's been really interactive. I've been so busy in juggling my multiple screens. Sorry, I didn't look at the comments. Thank you, everybody, for providing your input. And if you have any examples, experiences to share of your own, I'm all ears because as I mentioned, you know, I am really hopeful that this is, you know, something that helps us give that extra perspective. But, you know, I would love to hear from your side as well, if you would like to sh unmute yourself and share a little bit about how it went for you. Um, and you did comment that he says fun stuff. He also liked the hilarious error message boxes on their slides earlier. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I gathered those visuals when I was preparing an article uh, in for one of the blogs. Uh, it, it was from uh, three or four years ago. It was about seven type of errors that you know, uh, software testers should be aware of, and they, they were uh, about you know syntax syntax related errors and you know error handling related um defects and whatnot so yeah it was from there i had to dig dig those visuals but i thought it would help <laughs> you have ranjani uh hi uh, this is ranjani am i audible yeah we yeah. can hear you uh, hi, uh, so I have a question for you, Neha. So it's more of like uh, asking suggestions from you. So I'm currently working in a um, so banking industry and I'm working uh, for as a software, software lead engineer uh, for the QA team. And um, in my team, you know, we had some issues. Uh, we had this, we, we were following the scripted uh, testing approach. Mm -hmm. um, we have a vendor, so we our vendor provides the tool and we uh, they also have a test, testing side in their side, but we also do some testing on our side after we, they deliver the codes. So what happened to us was um, they did the scripted testing, they write the test cases as well. So they did the testing and then they delivered the test uh, product to us. And when it came to us, we kind of did some quick exploratory testing to edge cases. And we kind of found like, uh, like what you said, we did a extensive exploratory testing. It was really helpful. We found a lot of bugs and it was, uh, a uh, huge success on finding bugs, but it it was actually a drawback for the project itself because um, it was delaying the project, you know. Uh, but however, because we are finding a lot of issues in the exploratory testing, what we did in our, from our team is like we focused, uh, initially our intention was to focus mostly on automation so that we build the build pipelines and uh, we use the testing on a regular basis, you know, regression testing and stuff. But we changed our focus from this automation approach to execute the more concentrate on the exploratory testing so we could find more bugs so that at least the basic product is OK before we go to the automation stage, right? And that's the reason we did more on automation. And right now we are stuck. We couldn't do any progress in automation. We are still doing exploratory testing. We are still finding a lot of bugs, but it's much better than before. But um, you know what? We whenever we find some bugs in different feature, the previously tested and closed features in the previous prints are being broken. Like we find a lot of regression bugs more now than the new feature bugs. So we are in a situation that if we did concentrate more on automation rather than exploratory testing, we could have got the build pipelines and we could have avoided these kind of uh, issues. Uh, in the pipelines or in build levels, you know, we we now don't even know in which build it was really broken. We are finding these regression bugs manually just by like, say, for example, it's an online banking as an example. We are on the uh, transfers features or something. When we were trying to log in, we are finding some bugs now. 
So login is very basic ones and yep. th- those kind of uh, problems. So what would you recommend then? Do you compromise uh, automation and focus more on explore- complete exploratory or do you still think that um, we need to focus both on automation as well as exploratory? As you mentioned, we do have that uh, resource problem. So we are just four people, so we cannot dedicate like, uh, okay, two of us will do automation completely and two of us will do the uh, exploratory right so in that case how would you recommend it and all four of us are highly skilled with both automation as well as the exploratory and manual testing as well right so um i think it is there's the different things that can be done either on a process level or uh, directly on the testing approach that could help so i can share a few things um so f- based on you know how we've kind of um based on the projects that we've seen um for products that are really really stable and the features are you know kind of stable where they are um we automate all the stable features so what that gives us is that automation test script that we can use almost like a regression test uh, so that that we have that we run regardless of what the feature, what the change is. And uh, depending on the kind of change, we may need to run it for one um, application or for multiple impacted applications. Again, depending on what the change is, if it's like a store procedure that powers three different products, then those need to be checked as well. So um, that is one approach that we follow. So we automate all the stable features um, to get those at least out of the way, because those are really critical, let's say, functionalities that are stable and they should not have any unintended impact because of the changes that are being pushed or the new feature that's being done. So that has really helped us catch, um, you know, issues um, that are, um, let's say, that could be slipping into production without us knowing. So that helps us. So that's something that we already have. Um, in terms of working closely with the dev team what we have implemented is a sort of a field in the ticket uh, i use the term ticket because we use you know a ticketing system for our projects um, called impacted areas so the impacted areas are basically a list of areas this developer is making all the changes on so we know what to test and what potentially could break so if we are not able to you know um i would say clearly assess what the impact area is there's something clearly wrong in how we are, you know, I would say coordinating this change. So for us, having that tie, uh, like I'd say close relationship with the dev team uh, to rely on or lean on to them to give us some sort of an idea about the impacted areas has helped us a lot, especially if it's a controlled release. Uh, it helps us kind of get, uh, I would say, get get us to focus on the areas that need focus so that's that's another area where we seek or rely on the dev team uh if we do have any unintended impacted area that's something we uncovered during our regression automated tests uh other than that we of course would be doing scripted test for the feature that is going out and um, yeah if the time permits then we would be focusing on expiratory tests but if you do have let's say an idea of the impacted areas and some sort of a let's say automated um, coverage for the stable features i think these are the things that are repeat can be used repeatedly like that regression test suite can be run with every release right it can run in the background while you guys can focus on whatever else needs focus so i think there are different ways to tackle it depending on again um what the application is and um, again, the the maturity of the application, uh, the relationship with the dev team um, and such. So it, it's very hard to say like one thing's going to fix it, but these are the different things that can be useful. Uh, some are process level changes. Some are just uh, focusing on different aspects using different approaches. So automated approach for a certain section of the software and then supplement it by scripted tests for a certain new feature that is not yet automated. And then on top of that, you know, the icing on the cake could be the luxury of exploratory testing if you can. So I think those are some of the recommendations I would make just kind of, you know, knowing a little bit about how you explained it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. 
Whoa, there is a channel dedicated to exploratory testing. That's cool. Cool. Yeah. Anybody else would like to share their experiences? Um, for us, we at least find uh, by by regression automated test, uh, we at least find four or five unintended defects that creeped into, which were not part of the communicated impacted area. So with every cycle, that's that's something we expect now. So it, for us, it has been um, having that automation test suite for all the stable features really has great return on investment in that in the way it's being used. Quiet group here. I know they are they're very active and everybody's like typing a lot of comments and thank you everybody for the feedback. Means a lot. I was really, really scared to kind of go old school and you know getting inspired from my son's grade four report to come up with this topic to discuss. So I'm I'm glad you guys liked it. We do have a little bit of time left if anyone has any last minute questions or comments. Um, yeah, definitely we invite you to raise your hands and unmute and share, um, or you can also put it in the chat as well if you're more comfortable doing it that way. So Andrew, you can go ahead and unmute. Howdy, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. OK, cool. Um, I uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. I know it's it's a lot of preparation and all and also it was a lot of fun, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if um, w when you've got. Like either executives or managers that aren't test people or maybe not even like uh, on the development team, like what they what you could tell what you can tell them about like exploratory testing when you say that it's it was used to to test the test the product or feature like yeah um i think a big part of my role um and uh, you know the person leading the software testing team it is part of my role to educate uh our customers uh, and my customers would be you know the executives the product managers that i work with the dev manager and it is and uh, you know the devops managers the people who maintain infrastructure. So it's it's for me as uh, you know, that's part of my role to be that uh, person or that to to educate people when I'm explaining. I've had so many times, you know, I've seen people um, like I would say interchange the words and think they mean the same. They'll be like, oh, can you do a quick sanity check or can you do a quick regression test? And they'll use it in an interchangeable way. So that for me, that's an opportunity to like, OK, let me explain what what it means. Uh, and then maybe, you know, maybe that will help us understand if we are talking about the same thing. Or uh, Then like, no, actually, we mean if you can just check this one thing and I'm like, OK, this is completely different. But then without having that communication, I don't think it's 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 doable to um, educate people who do not know much about software testing and make them familiar with the keyword. So I try to always simplify and I try to, um, I would say, um, communicate in a way that the other person can understand. So if I'm talking to somebody who's technical, they would understand, you know, if I do talk about, you know what, actually the problem was where and when we looked into the log, we found this versus if I'm talking to a non-technical project manager, they would have no clue what I'm talking about. So for them, I'll be like, you know what, we found an error, there's a defect, you know, ask the developer to triage it or fix it and we'll take it from there. Versus, uh, it, again, somebody who's like probably in between. So we so it's part of my role to just you know cater the information based on the audience uh, and that's what i train my qa lead on and potentially you know qa manager and whatnot so we are that's that's what i believe in like that communication needs to happen because there's so many times that um 
there are things that probably I don't understand as well as um, the other person does. So I was having this discussion with somebody in DevOps and uh, we were talking about performance testing and potentially um, testing the recoverability of the application. And then um, I told him that, you know, we are aware of all the differences between the test environment and production. They are not the same. Uh, so we won't be able to translate the results, but we'll do a comparative. So we were just talking about the approach and whatnot. And he's like, you know what, if you are trying to test the recoverability, you won't be able to get the same, um, I would say, outcome on the test environment because um, we have some, he talked about some, some pools he was talking about, I can't remember, some some cycle, like some hoop cycles that are different on production and on test environment. And if let's say those those pools, as he was trying to explain, and I love him for simplifying that for me, because I was just like, what is he talking about? Because I'm not part of that, like I'm not exposed to that knowledge, right? So I don't know. And he tried to explain it. He's like, okay, think of it like a big swimming pool. Right now on production, we have a swimming pool. If we drain it for whatever reason, because the application stopped responding, it's going to take us six hours to fill that back. And for the application to recover at the same level, it would be before it crashed. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> but we don't have that on test environment. Uh, so we won't be able to replicate that. So like, like this is him, you know, trying to explain and trying to educate me on whatever he was trying to explain to me. So I think it's 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 an ongoing, I would say, exercise to continue to interact and be open um, to explain, no matter you know whoever you are talking to. Yep. So right. Thank you very much. Yes, sure. I think it's important, like not to. I guess sometimes I get start feeling like. Uh, like defensive or something like, oh, mm. let's, um, this is going to go badly. But I don't want to assume that we're all trying to get the same thing done. So, um, yeah, that's just, uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Andrew. Any other last minute questions before we wrap up for last minute um, experiences you, anyone wants to share about exploratory testing? Oh, oh um, not about exploratory testing, but we do have a lot of open, we are hiring in SAMAX uh, group. So if you are, if you are looking for your next opportunity, you know, feel free to browse the website. If you have friends who are looking for uh, a job, you know, just go to our website. I'm going to put the website name here. looking for a QA analyst myself. Samaxgroup.com. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we have um, lots can, of open I positions. I can share so. that with the group um, in a larger way too. If you like, I'll just like send out a message to everyone in Bank and let them know there's lots of job opportunities. Sure. Yeah. And I'm so sorry I missed the about me slide. Yeah. yeah. I just I don't know when it went out of my slide deck, but it had a picture of me having fun in the snow with my blanked out colleague that I don't want to share the name right now because she didn't permit me to. But it was, yeah, about the good times when we were still in office enjoying the snow. So um, our office is um, our office is in Burnaby uh, near that Still Creek Drive area, like near the Fortinet and, you know, the that area near the Gilmore Skytrain Station. And every time it snowed, uh, we would go out in the patio and we had like, if it snowed a lot, we would have like two foot of snow there and we would make snowman that's what we would do we would like you know make them um fancy with our you know those those what do you wear in the neck the what do you call the lanets like like what do you call like something that you wear in the neck like that has your id in it uh, those ones yeah oh, like lanyard Oh, Leonard, Leonard, yes, yes. yes. So, yeah, those ones. And we would, you know, dress them up with all the warm clothes that we had. And then we would click weird pictures and then they would melt away for three days and we could see them <laughs> from our window. But those were fun times. It was one of those pictures and I'm like, ah, I should have checked that. But anyways. Yes, if anyone wants to go build snowmen with Miha, make sure you go and check out the Simex Group website and see kind of jobs are open there if there's anything you're interested in. Probably. I think that's the fun part of having really awesome colleagues because the first thing we think of when it snows outside, we're like, what are we going to do now? Do we want to go out and build the snowman? Or maybe we just go to the park and we used to ha just have a snow fight. Like, 
nothing like it it just freshens you up you take like a break you can do it in lunch time and i think that's really awesome um if you have really cool colleagues and really good snow that season mm. that helps <laughs> perfect well yeah i can definitely speak for highlight like the simex group the office works with them and they're great people to work with so definitely if there is interest check out their website um, but if there are no last minute questions, we are almost at seven o'clock. So I think we're going to wrap up. Um, so a big, big thank you to Neha for taking the time to come and talk with us today. Um, I know I definitely learned a lot from the session. Hopefully you guys took a lot away as well. We have some great comments um, in the chat. Um, so thank you again. And thank you everyone for attending tonight. Um, and then look forward to seeing you again at the end of April, where I said earlier that we'll have Shane Gearson from Slack joining us. Uh, so stay tuned and I'll announce the topic probably in like a week or two as well on BankQ. Um, and we'll see you guys all then. Perfect. And then um, the recording for the session and any of the slides will be all posted in the VAG Zoom meetup as well. So in case you missed it or want to share it with anyone, that should all be up there. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, everybody, for coming.